Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second Sir John Monash Lecture for 2018 here at Monash University, Malaysia. Sir John Monash, for those of you who don't know of him, was an Australian Renaissance man. He was a soldier, engineer, civil servant, and academic, and he was vice-chancellor of the University of Melbourne from 1933 until his death eight years later. Monash believed that the purpose of education was not simply for the benefit of the learner, but for the benefit of society. He once said, and I paraphrase here, that the best hope for a country is the ballot box and a good education. And on the 19th of May this year, the Malaysian Rakyat demonstrated the value of the ballot box. The Sir John Monash Lecture Series provides Monash Malaysia an opportunity to engage with the community in Malaysia and the region through the promotion of thought leadership in areas that are strategic to the development of the region going into the 21st century. This is a part of the way in which Monash can support the second part of the Sir John Monash admonishment, the ballot box and a good education. That is, the intellectually challenging, engaged and thoughtful society. The public lecture series covers a wide variety of contemporary and interdisciplinary topics presented by high-profile thinkers, international leaders, policymakers, corporate leaders, and leading scholars. Our speakers are distinguished in their areas of expertise, and their work has made a significant impact on the global community. Human rights are embedded in the Sustainable Development Goals, but how we use them in our everyday lives and how we engage with them is often left to lawyers. This should not be the case. Today, we are very fortunate to have a distinguished human rights expert, Professor Dr. Sophia Gruskin, who will deliver the Sir John Monash Distinguished Public Lecture. Professor Gruskin is a professor of preventive medicine at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California and professor of law in the UCS Gould School of Law. She's also the director of the Institute for Global Health and of the program on global health and human rights. Her career in health and human rights is nothing short of extraordinary. The first peer-reviewed paper that she ever authored was in the, with the late Jonathan Mann and appeared in 1994 in Volume 1, Issue 1 of the Journal of Health and Human Rights, and the journal article was titled simply Health and Human Rights. This historical footnote underscores the pivotal role she has played in the development of the area. All I can do here is to note a small fraction of her career successes. She has held appointments at the Columbia Law School, Harvard School of Public Health, and the University of Southern California, she was the chairperson of the UNAIDS Global Reference Group on HIV, AIDS, and Human Rights from 2002 to 2006. She was a finalist for the appointment of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Highest Attainable Standard of Health in 2014. She adv has advised, chaired, or been a committee member for various international organizations, including WHO, UNAIDS, UNIFEM, UNDP, and the United Nations Officer, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She was also on the board of directors of the Guttmacher Institute from 2013 to 2017. Professor Gruskin will talk for somewhere between about 45 minutes and an hour, an hour, and leave the remaining time for an opportunity to engage in a discussion with the audience, and I'll moderate that discussion. Her talk is entitled Engaging Human Rights for Global Health, Sexual Rights and the Important of Definitions and Data to Drive Global Engagement. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gruskin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and to be with old and new friends and colleagues. Uh, and also to learn about all of the wonderful and innovative things that are happening right now in Malaysia. I, I'm really deeply honored to be here and to be able to put out some ideas which I hope can help stimulate uh, conversation and discussion. Um, I wanted to begin, actually, uh, by explaining a bit about why I want to discuss and, and why. Uh, like maybe many of you here, I not only engage in my local space, but I engage in global spaces. And I'm acutely aware of how what happens in these spaces can, with both intended and unintended consequences, affect people at the very most local level. To give a very recent example, I was in Cote d'Ivoire a while back as a part of a research project that I'm engaged in. And in the course of my work there, I met with the key populations network. Now, I didn't exactly know what a key populations network 
would be. Certainly in the course of my work, over the years I've met with many sex worker networks, I've met with many networks of people living with HIV, but I've never met with, for the first time, it was like this self-defined key populations network. And while this network brought together sex worker organizations and organizations of people living with HIV, what was striking to me was the ways in which the definition of key populations, which had found its way into the technical documents of a global organization like UNAIDS, was now, because of funding, but I want to be clear, not only because of funding, impacting the self-proclaimed identities of local activists, the bonds that they were forming, the ways in which they were working together, and how they were shaping their claims in dealing with different arms of the national government structure. And so for good or for bad, and whether one believes in the United Nations or not, uh, the definitions that are promulgated in the very different corners of the UN matter. They matter at a conceptual and at a theoretical level, but they also matter for funding, but they also ultimately matter for people's lived experience. And I believe nowhere is this the case more than when one thinks about sexual rights, and hence the focus of the talk. Um, when one is thinking about engaging human rights for global health, I think the way of based, best illustrating this is to talk about sexual rights. And I hope by through this to be able to make the case clear and for that to be able to open the way for a discussion amongst us. Now, because when I'm sitting in a room, I want to know as an audience member where things are going. This is a brief roadmap of where I'm going, just so you have a sense of it. Um, so you know what's coming and you know a bit where I'm going. And I, I want to begin by defining my terms. And perhaps because I have initial training as a lawyer, I think it's incredibly important to define what I mean when I use certain words. And so when I say global health, I mean really the commonality of issues we are all uh, addressing regardless of borders. We share the same health issues in Los Angeles as here in KL, but also in Bogota and also in Ouagadougou. And we can only really learn by working together how to address these issues most effectively. And so when I say human rights, it's not what I want them to be, and it's also not what you'd like them to be. What I'm getting at is that it's where there's international agreement about what they mean and about what obligations they carry. So having given this as kind of a framework in terms of definitions, let me ask you, when I say sexual rights, do you think we all mean the same thing? Do you think that all of us are defining them in the same way sitting in this room? And I have to say, it's a particularly strange time First to say, never in history has there been such a, an opening up, both societally and legally, to the range of things we can now understand to fall into the rubric of sexual rights as exists now in 2018. There are large-scale initiatives around the world to guarantee contraception and family planning to all people like we haven't seen in decades. There are an un unprecedented number of countries accepting gay marriage and at least acknowledging the existence of gay, lesbian, and in some places transgender populations. And there's growing recognition of sexual assault and sexual violence as a serious crime by governments, by institutions of power, and even the general public in many of our countries, including a strong statement on the need to protect the health and rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender populations last week by the Director General of the World Health Organization, something that has never happened before. So all of that is a very good thing. But at the same time in 2018, we're also seeing a huge and growing backlash against many aspects of sexual health and rights from all corners of the world, including not only outright violence and articulations of homophobia, anti-abortion actions by a range of governments and civil society actors, but also retrenchments on commitments to comprehensive sexuality education and to other aspects of sexual health and rights we once thought were not quite as contentious. And I have to say one of the elephants in the room is of course the current president of my country. <laughs> Sorry, but I do. Uh, his administration and what they are doing to, to dismantle protections for sexual and reproductive health and rights, not only within our borders, but across the world. And well, even having said this, I do need to say that we can't forget that prior to the Trump administration, things were not simple. Um, it's not as if a sexual rights agenda was moving forward across the globe without any problems, even prior to Trump. 
So beyond the issues within our countries, abortion, reproductive rights, sexual rights, particularly in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity, but also in terms of violence and adolescent sexuality, were already entangled in South-North, North-South, South-South, and North-North politics, a situation that was not helped when political leaders of governments such as the US under Obama or the UK under Cameron, who claimed in their foreign policy that their approach to sexual rights, for example, in relation to sexual orientation had to be mirrored in other places. So I guess the first point that I'm trying to make here is that sexual rights de denote very different things depending on the actor and the context. And in terms of actors at a very general level, first when we're thinking about governments and political leaders, it's important to distinguish what they say and do domestically and within their own countries and how this connects or disconnects with their foreign policy or their work at the international level within the halls of the UN. These can be quite the same or they can be quite different. But I'm also talking about the perspective of health and development organizations, of human rights bodies, of political actors and advocates, how these also reflect general political currents and social movements occurring within countries as well as at the global level. So it's not only about governments. And I mean this beyond a concern with sexual rights per se, but all of the things that impact the legal, the political, and even the technical standards that we who are concerned with advancing human rights for global health are forced to continue with in whatever area. So moving specifically now to sexual rights, I'm going to suggest that there are three overlapping streams that can be seen to shape much of the global landscape around health and rights, and that these can be loosely defined as the legal, the technical, and the political. Now, as I'm using them here, the technical stream covers concepts, norms, and standards and guidelines developed by research organizations, academic institutions, and in particular for these purposes, international technical agencies such as the World Health Organization and UNAIDS. Within the legal stream fall the formal parts of the human rights system, including the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the United Nations Treaty Monitoring Bodies, and other formal mechanisms such as special rapporteurs, as well as international, regional, and national court decisions. The political stream includes international, regional, and national governments, uh, government processes, with particular emphasis on the agreements that governments make with one another as these play out at the global level. And here I'm talking about, for example, coming out of the General Assembly, things like the Sustainable Development Goals. These streams have significant influence on one another, but they're sufficiently distinct in orientation and in priority that I hope that by naming them in this way that I can show how se sexual rights was, has been driven by these distinctions, how they influence them one another and why they do, and how this can account for advancements and retrenchments in what occurs, but ultimately then what that means for how we think about dealing with them. So let me start with the political. Sexual rights at the global political level starts with sexual health and starts with the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development, sometimes called Cairo, which was, amongst other things, the first intergovernmental agreement that attempted to define sexual health and also, for our purposes, reproductive rights. So Cairo defined reproductive rights, if not sexual rights. And here what's important is that reproductive rights were defined as part of reproductive health. Now, with respect to sexual rights, Arguably, there's been no language as important as the political articulation in the Beijing Platform for Action from the World, Fourth World Conference on Women in 1995. And again, sexual rights appears in the health section of the document. And importantly, it builds not only on Cairo, but grounds its articulation not only in politics, but within the internationally agreed legal human rights framework. Now, at this point in time in 2018, we can say the focus on women is problematic for many reasons. And it's important historically not to forget that this focus by governments on the health and rights of women, while absolutely problematic now, was essential in providing for the very first time an international mandate to focus on and invest in women's reproductive and sexual health and rights beyond simply the need to control women's fertility as part of a demographic agenda with no thought for their own health and well-being. 
Now, there are other concerns with this definition we can point to now. Not only that it's limited to women, it's focused only on health and its application and scope. And so I guess the point I want to make about this is sexual rights are relevant only because of their implications for health, a point that we will keep coming back to. Now, it also contains several other areas of concern. So for example, the use of the term responsibly, responsibly as defined by who and according to what criteria, as well as a primary focus on freedom from discrimination and violence and not any sort of positive potential, as in why sexual rights would be a positive thing. But it is the first governmentally agreed articulation of what has come to be known as sexual rights. And the point to make here is that Cairo and Beijing today, ostensibly because they are we were endorsed by a majority of the governments of the world, they remain, they remain today in 2018, the touchstone undergirding sexual rights in all spheres. Now, as a historical matter, reservations were taken to this paragraph by countries saying they wanted in no way to be seen as part of endorsing this. And I raise this here because, interestingly, many of the same countries continue to raise objections to sexual rights to this day at a global level, and they often cite the lack of international agreement on this definition for sexual rights as their reason for doing so. Now, the governments who took an explicit reservation to the sexual rights paragraph in Beijing include Malaysia, but they also include Sudan, Oman, Qatar, Yemen, the United Arab Emirates, Iraq, Egypt, Lebanon, Iran, Kuwait, Libya, Syria, Pakistan, Malta, the Philippines, Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, Venezuela, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mali, Togo, Niger, Maldives, and of course, the Holy See. And but in this respect, what I want to say, and as concerns our interests right now in 2018, it's worth recalling that India, Bolivia, Colombia, Panama, El Salvador, Cambodia, South Africa, Tanzania, and Cameroon are all countries that put on record their support for sexual rights as set forth as you see it here. Now, you may ask, where was Australia? Where was Canada? Where was the United States? And let me just say for the sake of this presentation, I'm happy to, to talk about it um, as we're in our conversation, but this was really a debate amongst countries of the South. Now, fast forwarding to more recent times, perhaps the most uh, forward-looking political articulation of sexual rights happened in 2013 at the Intergovernmental Latin American Caribbean Review of the 20 years since Cairo. And you'll note that this Montevideo consensus, um, as the, the first uh, document to actually name sexual rights, it actually uses the language of sexual rights, and it actually makes it clear that they don't extend only to women. And in this regard, I think it's worth noting that the Latin American governments have really been some of the key champions throughout the day to try to advance sexual rights concerns. Now, as I said, debates in the international political sphere always go back to Cairo and Beijing. So look at this 2013, also, Asia and Pacific Declaration on Population and Development, which happened later the same year and tries in a way to blend the Cairo and Beijing definitions I showed you earlier. Now, the breakdown of countries and objections and support here is quite telling, I think, for our purposes. 38 countries endorsed the definition you see up on the slide, including Malaysia and the United States. But a number of countries, like Nepal, raised objections about this new attempt to define sexual rights. Now, not surprisingly, Azerbaijan, Iran, and the Russia Federation explicitly voted against this definition and said they wanted no part in it. Now, perhaps because I'm from the US, I feel the need to expose some of what they've been saying and doing in global spaces around sexual rights, because I think it raises some important issues, not just because I feel the need to talk about my own government, right? So let me say again, going back to the Obama administration, uh, which in many ways was the most forward-looking in their approach to sexual rights, and certainly goes without saying more so than the current uh, administration. Now, even with Obama, perhaps nothing is more telling than the statement they put forward at the UN Women's Executive Board. Now, many thought this was a great thing, but 
Just take a look at this. Now, they began using the term sexual rights and said they would begin to use the term sexual rights along with the phrase sexual and reproductive health and rights in human rights and development discussions. And in doing this, you'll see the U.S. drew explicitly on paragraph 96 from the Beijing platform and extended it beyond women to say all individuals. It's a right of all individuals. But then they go on to say, the term sexual rights or sexual and reproductive health rights express rights which are not legally binding. Sexual rights are not human rights, and they are not enshrined in international human rights law. Now, I can say that this may be interpreted as a prime example of a government cherry picking part of a definition to suit their purposes. But the confusion in, in what this means about variations between the political nature and the legal nature of sexual rights, and by extension, the ways in which the political, the legal, and the technical are sometimes, but not always, consistent with one another is the point I'm trying to make here. So just think about this in relationship to the Sustainable Development Goals. And we all love the Sustainable Development Goals, right? And the idea of leaving no one behind. But if we're honest, even from the start, the SDGs recognize sexual and reproductive health and rights in a rather awkward formulation. Whether as a result of fear or of politics, just look at the mismatch between sexual and reproductive in 3.7 here and the fact that only the term reproductive makes it into what is ultimately said to be appropriate to be put into national strategies and programs. This inconsistency in terminology has had major implications for the targets and the indicators that were set and have had major implications for the sorts of data to be collected by countries, therefore what funding is made available and for what programs exist and even for people at the most local level what it means that they're able to deal with. Now, the, the issue is um, the intersection, sexual rights at their most basic are not really visible as part of the SDG agenda even as there is some promise in the gender goal uh, of the SDGs, is it in that it signals attention to interventions that will improve equality between women and men. It's fairly clear that the gender intended in the SDGs is a static male-female binary. And, and once again, that while sexual and reproductive health is explicit and reproductive rights are explicit, sexual rights are not. So as we see the Sexual, as we see the SDGs as our blueprint for the future and want to ensure that no one is left behind, we need to see these limitations clearly and we need to think strategically about how the SDGs can nonetheless be used to support sexual rights so that all people can flourish. And I mean that even within the current political moment. Now, as for the legal, an interesting trend has incurred in legal protections for sexual rights at the global level, in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity in particular. Entities within the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights have increased protections to protect people from discrimination and violence on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in myriad ways, but they don't use the term sexual rights to do so. When the term sexual rights or reproductive rights are used, it appears primarily to be about women and women implicitly assumed to be in heterosexual sexual relationships and often again drawing on Beijing. Now, health has been a strategic entry point within the international legal sphere, particularly linked to HIV, with some major advances being made through key international and national rulings justified as necessary for public health. And there, in terms of as relevant to people's lives, over and above for health, those are not reasons that seem to count. The landmark Tunin case, which came out, out of Australia, is a prime example of this, where the, Tas where the Human Rights Committee said that the Tasmanian law, which criminalized homosexuality, was to be condemned. But they said it was be to be condemned because of its impact on reduction of HIV not because it was problematic in its own right. So I'm getting at the health piece of this being the justification for so much of what's done. Now, looking at this, um, I'm about to say something about specific rights, so these are the treaties that I'm pulling the rights from. 
So in terms of which human rights are considered to make up the orbit of sexual rights within the legal sphere, the UN human rights treaty monitoring bodies give attention to the application of international human rights law to various dimensions of sexuality, autonomy, non-discrimination, equality, accountability, participation, and, and empowerment, particularly in the context of international cooperation but none use the term sexual rights. Most relevant, perhaps, is the recent general comment put out by the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that names a right to sexual and reproductive health per se. Um, so there have been some tentative advancements in several also of the special rapporteur reports. But it's fair to say that the growth of sexual rights within the legal sphere has been particularly focused on protections from discrimination and violence, whether they focus on sexual orientation or heterosexual women, but always within a health context. In terms of the technical, as concerns the technical. Interestingly, in 1987, WHO uh, European Regional Technical Document was the first to flag the importance of the legal and policy environment in relation to sexuality. And note that this is in relationship to, hom to homosexuality and to abortion. Now, more than a decade later, in 2000, the Pan American Health Organization and the World Association for Sexology convened a regional consultation where, amongst other things, it was stated that since protection of health is a basic human right, it follows that sexual health involves sexual rights. This is really the first clear articulation of how human rights are thought to be relevant to sexual health and to explicitly name sexual rights. It's from WHO. And in many ways, this still drives the approach taken by WHO and other technical actors to sexual rights. Now, the history between 2000 and the present are not worth getting into, except to say that along with UNAIDS, WHO is the most willing to use the fact that it's a technical agency and that its work is based on evidence to try to avoid the political constraints in order to push the envelope towards rights protection. Um, and here I note that while this says 2002, this is still the definition on the WHO website. So suffice it to say that this working definition uh, of, sexual, uh, of sexual rights uh, in a technical document is anchored, anchored in the legal human rights documents as well as in the political consensus documents like Cairo and Beijing. So what's the point of all this? Now, the work of the WHO the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and international organizations such as the World Association for Sexual Health, amongst others, has led to a technical and increasingly a legal understanding that sexual rights are both relevant to all populations and grounded in international and regional human rights documents. At a global level, actors in each sphere often rely on the definitions of the other. And it may be fair to say that while the political represents the lowest common denominator across all spheres, legal definitions use the political and the technical to undergird the legitimacy of any positions that they stake, particularly concerning the links between sexuality and human rights more generally. For the technical, and this is most apparent in the work of the WHO, they use evidence, and evidence includes legal definitions. Legal definitions count as evidence to give shape and support to the importance of sexual rights as necessary for sexual health. And to note, those on the technical side, like WHO, tend to bring human rights and law into their work on sexual health because human rights and law matter for health outcomes. The focus is not on rights per se, but because the promotion of or impediment to sexual rights have an impact on health. And the emphasis on health in almost all of this reveals that at this point in time, sexual and reproductive rights for almost all actors in the global sphere um, the justification for dealing with sexual rights is health and not rights pertaining to sexuality for all people in, in their own, for their own sake. The political environment ultimately plays the critical role in which issues are taken up and which are left aside in all spheres, including the technical and the legal. And so I have to say, despite technical and, and, and ad, advances in the technical and the legal spheres, in 2018, there are no universal political standards that recognize anyone who is not an adult woman, including men and transgender populations, to have sexual rights. 
nor are sexual rights, at least at a political level, yet valid for any reason other than health. So what's, what does this mean for transgender populations? And what does this mean in terms of the international classification of diseases? So we're now at a moment of moving into, moving from the international ICD-10, the international classification ICD-10, to ICD-11. So let me start by saying something about the international classification of diseases, as it offers, I think, a very clear example of why we need to pay attention to the legal, the political, and the technical as distinct, yet incredibly interconnected. For folks who don't know the ICD, it's relevant to all countries around the world. It has huge implications for resources, as everything listed in it has an ICD code, which is key to billing and to medical records, as well as to public health surveillance and to access to health care. Crucially, think about this, in a world of 7.4 billion people speaking nearly 7,000 languages, the ICD provides the common vocabulary for recording, reporting, and monitoring health problems in countries around the globe. The last time it was updated was in 1990, something we'll come back to in a minute. So this is how the ICD-10 has conceptualized being transgender. Now, while of course the key thing to note is not just the language of transsexualism, but that it's listed as a mental and behavioral disorder. Note also the binary oppositional language of opposite sex, therefore denoting really only a static female and static male conceptualization of gender. So like I said, WHO classifications are intended to provide a basis for utilization of services and health statistics, but the creation and use of ICD classifications go much further. They're both embedded in and they reflect complex global and national political, legal, regulatory, and policy environments. And I think this is a really telling example. Restrictions on driving by transgender people put out by the Russian government in 2014 based on the ICD classification because trans issues appear in the mental and behavioral disorders chapter. But think about what this means about your gender marker and your identity card more generally. What's on your identity card is key to driving, but it's also key to voting, and also simply to accessing health, education, and social services. And just to say, transgender people may not be allowed to vote because their identity card's gender marker doesn't match how they present. And this is in, even in countries who think they have positive gender recognition laws that are assumed to be non-discriminatory. So gender markers matter. What's on your identity card matters. And ultimately what matters is to think about how the ICD classifies who we are and how they think about how people are, are meant to be conceptualized. Now, in order to review and move from ICD-10 to ICD-11, there were two departments at WHO that were responsible for leading on this work. And these are the organizations, these are the parts of the organization that work with external colleagues in order to provide the evidence base and to do the research to be able to move to show that these old definitions were harmful and that there were new definitions that were necessary, but there was work to be done to determine what those new definitions should be. Now, I think I think the first question you might ask is, should transgender phenomena even be included in the ICD? Or is it better to remove transgender people from the ICD in general? And um, there was much debate and much discussion, but it became clear that it was necessary to stay in the ICD, that transgender groups wanted to be there, particularly because the ability to access silicone to access hormone treatments, to access any health concerns, needed, you need to have an, an ID code in order for that to be able to happen. So once you agree that you want to ensure that transgender populations are included within the ICD, the question then becomes, how do you ensure that the, di the diagnosis is going to help people to ac access the treatment they need and not be pathologizing? How do you ensure that the new definition would be able to facilitate care, be grounded in, in, in evidence? And here's where politics come in not only be acceptable to transgender people and healthcare professionals, but to member states, because ultimately the ICD gets voted on at the World Health Assembly, which is a political space, not necessarily a technical space. So 
in at the working group met and, and determined that for ICD-11, there should be two categories, gender incongruence of adolescence and adulthood and gender incongruence in childhood. And I'm only going to focus on gender incongruence in adolescence and adulthood. And these are the draft definitions that were put forward and accepted based on evidence. And I, I want to point out in particular, as these definitions to be put into ICD-11, as you'll note, they are not static in terms of a binary male-female, in terms of how they conceptualize gender. And that there is, in terms of how the ICD has, has been oriented, there's, an, there's a recognition about the fact of gender fluidity in, in terms of what's written here and, and how, how it is set up. Now, the, ultimately, in order to do, do this work, one of the things that was necessary, and again, we can talk about this if people are interested in, in the discussion, is it was necessary to provide an evidence base to show not only the, the harms caused by the existing definition, but why the new definition would be better for health more generally. So this is where we are now. It's been almost 20 years, and in this time, we've had all the developments in the sexual rights arena I mentioned earlier. And on the 18th of June, so just really, um, six weeks ago, WHO released a version of ICD-11 for what is being said is necessary to allow member states time to plan implementation. So ICD-11 has come out as a technical document. This is anticipating the presentation of ICD-11 at the World Health Assembly in 2019 for adoption by countries, which then moves it into the political realm. Countries will not adopt it and will not change what it is that they have in place until it goes through the World Health Assembly process. But here's the big issue, and this is why I raise it in the context of this talk. The ICD is ostensibly a technical manual, but it's ultimately voted on by a political body, not a technical one. So as you can see from the Russian example I just showed you, the definition they agree on has real-world real world implications for national law and for ultimately for people's lives. So please keep an eye on what's going to happen in 2019 at the World Health Assembly, and please think about what work we need to do to make sure that this technical definition does not get watered down because of politics. Now, I want to close with a couple of big picture issues um, that I think some may seem more obvious than not, but that I hope can be useful for our discussion. So the first concerns whether we need agreement on the terminology, content, and legal status of sexual rights so that actionable commitments can continue to grow. Or can this happen without actually spending time getting that agreement? Are sexual rights legally binding? Do they need to be? Have, how one sees the relationship between sexual rights and human rights is critical for any number of reasons, but importantly, it distinguishes whether sexual rights are considered implicit in existing human rights law and therefore enforceable, or whether they are not yet established under law and therefore not yet legally enforceable. Also, at this point in time, do we want to make the links between sexual rights and reproductive rights more overt? Many years, for many years, sexual rights advocates pushed for distinguishing sexual rights from reproductive rights. Increasingly, progressive voices are seeing important linkages between them. For example, the decision to carry or terminate a pregnancy can be seen as an aspect of a woman's capacity to decide to link or to delink sexual activity from the decision to become a parent and engages the rights to health, privacy, and non-discrimination, amongst other rights. So what's to be gained or lost, given current geopolitics, by making the linkages more explicit? There's also the question about the health orientation of sexual rights, as they've come to be defined at the international level. What's lost or gained by this health focus on sexual rights, rather than sexual rights for their own sake? And even if you do accept the health entry point for sexual rights, does it matter how relevant HIV has been to the development of sexual rights standards? HIV has played a major role in growing standards that offer rights protections around sexuality and sexual health. 
Mostly these have happened under the technical stream with UNAIDS leading the way. And this has been really important in terms of growth around uh, protections around sexual orientation and gender identity for sex workers in terms of forced sterilization, in terms of gender-based and sexual violence. But the question remains, what will HIV's privileged place in the development of sexual rights standards mean over the long term in terms of the, or the orientation of standards that are not related to HIV at all? in terms of what gets prioritized and how we understand sexual rights and even sexual health more generally. And so, and what about pleasure? We talked about sexual rights and sexual health, but what about sexual pleasure? Historically, sexual health and rights policies and programs have tended to focus on preventing negative consequences associated with sexuality, such as unintended pregnancies, HIV, and STI prevention and treatment, and addressing sexual dysfunction. The importance of addressing the negative consequences of sexual health behaviors is clear, but in many cases, this approach has failed to recognize that some of the primary factors behind sexual health risks are issues that relate not only to rights, but to pleasure and to people seeking pleasure and sexual desire and not about mor morbidities and mortalities. How much of this is or should be the business of the state? Well, sexual pleasure has been widely discussed and defined in the context of sexology. In the political, legal, and even the technical avenues and spheres, it really hasn't been, but should it be? The World Association for Sexual Health, as far back as 2008, called on governments to recognize the importance of sexual pleasure in research, in policy, and in service delivery, and in connecting this to sexual rights, not only to be free from violence, but from the perspective of positive sexuality. Putting pleasure at the center as an element that is intrinsically linked to sexual health and sexual rights without reinforcing fear or shame seems like a good thing, but is it going too far? Will diverse understandings of gender always be at issue in advancing sexual rights? Diverse understandings of gender, particularly connected to the varied stream of sexual rights work, continue to cause problems not only in the political, but also for the technical and legal developments around sexual rights. Attention is needed to the fact that gender and sexual systems are linked, but they're not identical. In practice, of course, this means not confusing the gender expression of an individual with their sexual partner choice. Effeminate men can be heterosexual. Trans women can have heterosexual or homosexual orientations. Lesbians can look conventionally feminine. The, what matters for rights work is this recognition, uh, in particularly because the legal and policy work needed to end restrictions on sexual behavior, including same-sex sexual behavior, is not identical to the legal and policy work that's needed to defend various gendered behaviors and identities. Rights clearly have to be understood to attach in both domains, the gender and the sexual, but different rights and different policies may, need, may be needed in order to effectively respond. What do you do about people under the age of 18? We now see attention to heterosexual, to homosexual, to transgender, and intersex rights debates as these concern young people. Where there are positive advances, and there are some, these tend to be in the areas of rights relating to access and use of health and social services. Not surprisingly, we see far less in terms of actionable rights affirming the sexual rights of people under the age of 18. While banning child marriage is clearly something we all want, is it appropriate to make this one and the same as banning adolescent sexuality? There has been remarkably little questioning as to the sexual rights and interests of people under 18 and of differentiating what this means for the 17-year-old as opposed to the 8-year-old. In terms of who gets counted, um, as we find ourselves in this SDG world and consider how best to support a diverse sexual rights agenda in the programmatic work of intergovernmental organizations, um, we have to ask, how are we going to measure progress in sexual rights in this global context? There's first the problem of normative inclusion. Only some sexual rights, as linked to reproductive rights, only for conventional women, are included in the SDGs. Issues, topics, and rights that address the diversity of sexualities, the intersection of sexual and gender diversity, let alone sexual rights at their most basic, are not visible. 
which groups, which donors, which UN agencies, and which na nations are going to develop the frameworks to support the programming and produce the data for these potential measurements of progress. Second, even as there's some promise in the gender inclusion in the SDGs, at least as far as, far as it signals uh, attention to interventions that will improve equality between women and men, as I said, it's fairly clear that gender in the SDGs is the static gender of male-female binaries. And there's very little interest at a global level in assessing how progress is made in relation to gender variant persons. Equally importantly, as indicators are, in my, in my mind, I have a dog, are the, are the tail that wags the dog. How can these measurement exercises be used to promote shifts in gendered sexualities that tend not only towards health, but towards more tolerant states of mind for sexual rights to flourish for all people? And finally, my biggest concern is about the next generation. As we all know, sexual and reproductive health and rights generate strong opinions that are often steeped in social values, in ideology, and in morality. The next generation of researchers, of implementers, of policymakers, and of advocates, how or what they understand about sexual and reproductive rights are key to where the field will be in 10 years, let alone in 20. How do we ensure the political does not get in the way of what people need to learn in order to be effective researchers, programmers, policymakers, and human beings. There is a dire need for sustained dialogue on priorities and lessons to be learned applicable across disciplines, ages, institutions, and continents. And allow me to close by broadening out yet again and to talk about what this means for engaging human rights and global health work more generally. From my perspective, there must be systematic and rigorous attention to definitions, to human rights standards, to law, and to public health evidence for work in global health to take us where we want it to. And this is going to require support for research, for teaching, for training, for programming that is not siloed, but that brings these strands together. Who is vulnerable or disadvantaged clearly will vary between countries and within countries, but we need vigilance to ensure that a focus now and in the future on human rights results in better decision making, both locally and globally, at a technical level, at a legal level, but also at a political level. A concern for health means we must all be concerned with ensuring greater support for the human rights of all people and how this translates into lived experience for everyone, everywhere in the world, and without distinction. We must truly leave no one behind. Thank you.